Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the IC Online PG class. Yeah. Uh, good evening, all. Welcome to ISA Online PG classes. Hello. Today, we have a very, very special class, which is very important to all of us. And it is on communication skills. We have Vice President ISA National, Dr. Anjali Bhure, who shall be speaking on how to break the bad news. We have Dr. Hitendar Mahajan, who shall be discussing about OT etiquettes. And finally, Dr. Divya Gupta will be speaking about non-verbal communications. Communication is very, very important for anesthesiologist in all fields, whether it is pre-operative, intraoperative, and post-operative, and in the ICU, in the pain clinics, in the PSAs, and in the OPDs. I'm really thankful to all the three esteemed speakers. Rather than having a one hour long class, we'll be having 20 to 25 minutes, three short classes. And you can ask your questions, queries in the chat box also. And subsequently, we will have a live interaction also. Before I invite Dr. Nishan and Dr. to coordinate, few announcements are there. The ISA online fellowship exam will, not, will be held now on 17th October on ISA app, ISA NHQ. Last date for registering is 10th October. This is for postgraduates who are doing their PG degree. And those who have passed MD anesthesia in 2022 are also eligible. Secondly, as a part of our Amrit Mahasav ISA Platinum Jubilee celebrations, we are relaying the ISA flame throughout all the city branches of ISA across the country with the theme, light the spark of ISA in your heart. And doing a massive public awareness program the theme, know about anesthesia, know your anesthesiologist. All of you are requested to participate actively in all the activities of Indian Society of Anesthesiologists and feel proud of being ISCN, feel proud of being in ISA. I finally say that we are ISCNs, not because we are in ISA, but because ISA is in us. Thank you very much. Uh, over to you, Nishant. Uh, for the coordination of today's class and so thank you so much sir and uh, as uh, is the case every monday sir we have our uh, isa online pg classes and today is slightly special because rather than one, one hour class we'll be having uh, three classes by three very eminent speakers uh, sir this will be the this will be the 63rd class in a series of uh, isa online classes and uh, Speakers of national repute spare their valuable time uh, for the uh, for the benefit of all the postgraduates and the young faculty also. And uh, today we have a very special guest. We have uh, Dr. Anjali Bure, ma'am, who will be presenting the first uh, talk. Uh, she is the professor and head of the NKP Salve Institute of Medical Sciences and RCN LMH Nagpur. She has more than thirty three years of experience with interest in obstetric anesthesia, CPR, and public awareness. She is, uh, we all know that she's the vice president of ISA National and has been the governing council member of ISA National uh, from 2016 to 2019, honorary secretary of the West Zone of ISA from 2009 to 2015, uh, president of the ISA NCB 2009, the MSCISA advisory board member and organizing chairman of the MSC ISA ISACON 2021 of Nagpur. 
she has many publications more than 32 national and uh, two international publications uh, she has been instrumental in winning many of the branch best branch awards at the national level 11 uh, best branch awards at the national level chennai at uh, icon 2009 first prize best branch award at maharashtra state chapter at uh, m icon 2010 most active member ICNCB 2013, the Srimati Sushila Sathe Memorial Award in 2017 and the MS Signature Academic Award in 2021. Uh, we know her as a very gentle soul and then it will be very nice uh, if she labeled, she's able to tell us about uh, how to break the bad news. Uh, Ma'am, all the audience will be muted uh, till the time your uh, lecture is going on. Just in case there are any questions by any audience member, they are encouraged to type in the chat box. If at all you have any questions, again, they are uh, encouraged to answer them in the chat box itself. So over to you, ma'am. A very warm welcome. Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Nishant. And I must thank ISA for giving me this opportunity. Now, amidst the festive mood and Platinum Jubilee celebration days, we are having this important topic. And I'm extremely thankful for the same. I'm going to share my screen now. Is that okay? Yes, it is visible, ma'am. Okay. So, breaking the bad news. Now, when any news has to be delivered, you need a sender and you need a recipient. If we talk in terms of hospital or a medical college or any healthcare setup, then it will be a doctor who's delivering a news and it is communicated to the recipient, could be patient or it could be patient's relatives. Now, if it is a good news, that's okay. Everything is good and hopeful and the patient and the relatives are happy. But if adverse thing is there, we want to communicate something bad because bad news is going to be bad. But how it is communicated, that will depend and the whole patient's outcome, the patient's recovery, overall lifestyle will be dependent. So the outcome will basically depend on how the bad news is communicated. And that is why this deliberation today. So what is the bad news? As we can see here, situations where there is either a feeling of no hope or threat to person's mental or physical well-being, risk of upsetting an established lifestyle, any information which adversely and seriously affects an individual's view, Buckman, and any information that is not welcome. So, as we can see here, that there are various subjective definitions. Not one definition is there. Now, here you can see professional bicyclist Lance Armstrong, what he wrote. He wrote, I left my home on October 2nd, 1996, as one person. And I came back home as another because he was suffering from metastatic testicular tumor. So it is very important that it being a subjective feeling, every time we don't know what's going to happen. It is subjective feeling for the patient, for the relatives, even the doctor who's involved. So there are three things which we are going to discuss today. The doctor, the patient, and of course, the relatives. So why the conversations are difficult? What is the reason why the doctor feels very discomfortable when he wants to deliver? Because we don't have any formal training, which induces anxiety and sadness because how the patient is going to take up. Is there is always a fear of impending negative reactions from the patient or the relatives. Self-feeling of inadequacy and guilt contribute to this discomfort. And revealing bad news will extinguish hope of meaningful recovery for the patient. Abhi sab kuch teek chal tha, and now suddenly you feel that what will the patient and family do? So we are scared of the negative reaction which is coming up. So what are the various methods 
which are there to deliver this bad news. There is breaks protocol, there is sad news approach, there is McPhee's ABCD, there is Bale and Buckman spike approach, which is so commonly used. And in the latest literature, I could find this sunburn protocol in trauma and acute care. So there are various approaches, but all of them mostly have similar kind of points to be considered. So we are going to consider spike approach today. So what does it say? So spike stands, it is the acronym stands for setting up in privacy. So you have to have a private setup for that. Then perception of the patient how much the patient knows and what information we have to give. So invitation to break the news. Is the patient ready to accept the break news, uh, to break the news? Then how much knowledge does the patient have and what are his emotions? Is he in denial? Is there anger or there is fear? What it is and what are the strategies which we are going to offer to the patient? So this was developed at Anderson and Toronto Sunnybrook Cancer Center for use in medical oncology patients. So we come down to setting the environment, setting the stage for optimal communication by preparing what to say. So first and foremost important thing, we should know that what we have to, we have to plan and prepare what is the clinical course or what exactly has gone wrong with the patient and how are we going to take this course to the patient and a strong unified consistent message among all the members of the healthcare team is essential the whole team should know what needs to be said so it is not only your rehearsal but it is the rehearsal of the whole team setting up also includes an attention to physical space whether the space is private whether it is uninterrupted whether you have enough time to communicate this important thing to the patient and your mobiles should be off so all these things, who all are going to attend, whether the patient is going to come or the patient's relatives are going to come. So all these things will come into play. The rules of preferred body language. Now, this is one of the most important thing which the uh, speaker, next speaker is going to deal with. Your body language carries most important uh, part for the communication because it has to be optimally communicated. You have to sit properly. Your posture should be appealing and you should be directly having eye contact. Asking the patient to quieten their personal communication technologies, you have to keep your mobiles off. And you have to eliminate your body signals. You should not seem to be restless or nervous because that is very important for establishing rapport with the patient. The perception. What is the patient's perception of the news to be shared will determine on how the news is conveyed to the patient. So patients' denial behavior are very important management strategies for patient and family in dealing with overwhelming loss. So breaking of bad news should not shatter this important coping strategies or coping mechanisms with the patient or the relatives will have. So invitation. We have to inquire that when the patient is ready to understand and the context in which the information fits, and we have to take permission from the patient that when he's ready to take up the information and up to what level he can take it. The knowledge. First step in actually delivering news is to fire a warning shot. That means you have to update the patient that something bad is going to come. So this is just a warning shot. And then, the beginning of a discussion with phrases such as, unfortunately, I'm sorry, but I have a bad news to tell you, or I'm sorry to tell you, things are not going in direction as we hope. So, and wait for some time, give a pause, let it sink in the patient or the relative's mind that something wrong is going to come. Empathy. This is the most important thing. Patient will have wide range of emotional reactions. And the response may range that patient suddenly may become silenced or dramatically will start screaming or crying or will just keep on moving in the room. But you have to give time to all this to vent out his feelings because empathetic communication is very important and appropriate kind response to emotion demonstrated when the patient hears bad news is critically important. And what strategies do you have for future? 
So we need to do all this. We need to have a preparation, the whole team, and then we strategize what is there for the patient so that every options which is available can be discussed with the risk and the benefits. This is another approach which advanced preparation. Almost every uh, 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 approach is letting you know the same. And this was also developed for primary care. And then psych approach, breaks approach. Breaks approach was actually for palliative care patients, which was developed in India. Sad news approach. And now the sunburn protocol. Now, the sunburn protocol in trauma and acute care surgery. Now, this is a protocol which is related to trauma and acute care surgery, which stands for S for setup, understand perceptions, notify warning shots, brief narrative and breaking bad news, understand emotions, respond, and then what are the next steps which could be coming. Now, this is a protocol which importantly says that your non-verbal behavior will encompass 55% of how the patient is going to receive. Vocal 38% and actual words are going to have impact on the patient only 7%. So it is very important that non-verbal behavior, vocal and actual words are also taken into consideration. So in the previous protocols, maintaining the patient physical uh, physician relationship was important because it was related to the primary care or the palliative care and cancer patient. Now, this is trauma and acute care surgery, where actually this is an area where most of us are involved in. And this has actually coming. And the difference is that we have minimal to no opportunity to build up rapport with the patient or the relatives. And so the therapeutic relationship is often very short-lived. So what are the spare barrier specifics to tracks? This, the previous protocols were designed for oncology and primary care. Now they have poorer application in tracks because that won't be applicable because we don't have any prior therapeutic relationship. And warning shot deserves a good importance and great emphasis in tracks because this is where the sudden nature creates a greater shock and can make information much more overwhelming. And these patients are younger and healthier the circumstances are sudden, unexpected, and shrouded in misconception. It is utter confusion. Nobody knows what is happening. These patients are often present on nights and weekends in which there is less staff available coverage and fewer resources for grief support. So coming, we discuss now the first one. You take a moment to compose yourself because it is very important that you are stable when you're going to deliver the uh, bad news. Appreciate the event and clear what has happened, what was the event which has triggered this, and you should know the clinical code. So you have to reverse, uh, rehearse about the event and clinical code. Mentally prepare what you will say. And if you are having any clothes, which are your linens, uh, which are have blood stain, you should be removing. You should be changing clothes into cleaner ones. Use a quiet room. Have a safety strategy. There should be an exit in case there is some kind of violence in the room. You should be able to. So safe strategy should be played. Bring an experienced nurse, family, friends can be supportive, but avoid excessive large groups. Now, when these patients come, you normally find large groups are accompanying, which will actually spoil and they, there are chances that the violence can occur. Do not forget the most important thing. Con uh, conversation should always be in the presence of surgeon and all the conversation must be transcribed. Now you understand the perception. Introduce yourself and the team members to the members who are sitting in that room uh, along with the patient or the patient's relatives. Appreciate what information they already know. You sit down and don't talk in the corridor. Chalte chalte humne baat kar li, that carries no meaning. You have to have a room in silence where you can give time to the patient's relatives. Sit down, eye contact and look at who you are addressing. Now, this plays a very important thing. Give a warning shot and a brief pause because they need to have some, so that the bad news can be sunk in properly. Then brief narrative and break bad news. Give a brief narrative for contest and then deliver the news. Be honest and direct. For patients who are dead, use the word death or dead and avoid euphemism, passed away. So it is always better to uh, tell directly use the words dead or death. 
for patients who are alive, concentrate on big picture. Now, if a patient is there with a brain injury and there are ribs fractured, so then you might say seven ribs are fractured. So instead of that, concentrate on a big picture <coughs> because <coughs> the patient's relative will be concentrated on these minor things rather than on a big picture, that is the brain injury. Avoid excessive technical information, unnecessarily gruesome details, heart tuta water. There is no need. The patient's relatives are already in the shop. Understand emotions, allow for silence. When you're giving a warning shot, there's going to be a dynamism of various emotions coming out from the patient or the patient's relatives. So give some time for them and appreciate the emotional response. You should be ready to take the emotional responses and tackle accordingly. How do we respond? Do not rush. Provide tissue if you have. Appropriate physical contact can provide a natural comfort. You can hold hand with the permission or you can tap the shoulder. Do not try to touch the cheek or thigh, which might not be liked because our culture is different. Avoid platitudes or false sympathy. Do not concentrate on yourself. We have seen that it is not that it is not that is, that moment is for them and we need not give our examples provide support to them answer whatever questions they have or whatever queries they have and continue to focus on the big picture so aapke patient ko brain injury hui hai iske wajah se the patient is serious so this is very important when we are dealing so what are the next steps discuss the next steps or strategy what we are going to do the next and what are the benefit and the risk if we have options, well and good, we can offer the options with risk and benefit and let them have a chance. We need not paternalize what needs to be done, but we can be with them to choose their options. I provide an opportunity for the family to see the patient if they want. And in case there is death, then the family should be allowed to see. And in the rest of the administrative procedures, the medical staff or a social worker can be of help to them. So what we should be doing? Uh, our conversation should be empathetic, patient-centered communication. That means it is client-centric counseling. Carl Rogers has been <coughs> very, very kind enough to tell us that we have to be genuine and congruent. That means every patient is different and there has to be a tailor-made strategy for every patient. Offer unconditional positive regard. Feel and communicate deeply empathetic understanding. Most positive outcome on cognitive, evaluative, and emotional level. Privacy and uninterrupted time, we have already uh, said. Clarity of message, written summary. Then ensure safety once the patient leaves the room because you have to take care of the patient. If the patient is going and is going to drive, that's going to be dangerous. So a caring attitude of well-informed, sympathetic caregiver who gives families a clear message is able to answer the question. And most important, when they are going out, please ensure you tell them I am there and my team is there whenever you need us. You take this phone number, you can communicate with me anytime or with my team members. And instructions should be given who's going to deal with this. Empathy, a word which deserves a discussion, nurse. So N is for naming the emotions. So you have to judge in what level the emotions are. Understanding patient's feeling. <coughs> respect verbally and non-verbally support statements that may express concern what can i do for you exploring willingness to help and in-depth knowledge of the disease one must have whatever the patient is going through we must have in-depth knowledge what event has happened and how it is going to go further emotional status what are the coping skills the relatives of the patient have what is the educational level support system cultural, ethnic background, background and transcribing the conversation. What are the don'ts? Avoid patronizing, avoid hostile attitude, hurried way. Our corridor mein bat ke bhi are telling, Mujhe jaldi jana hai. I have a next patient, I don't have time for you. Avoid lengthy monologue. Ab jitna jada bologe, usme patient will catch up something which is convenient to him or the relatives. Hence, you have to be very concise, short and clear. Stories of the patient with similar plight. Are, ek patient humne dekha tha, usme aisa hi hua tha, no. 
This time, only this patient and patient's relatives are important. We need not quote examples of ourselves or other patients. Unrealistic treatment options should not be given and beware of differential learning. So of what are these differential learning? Offering premature reassurances, advices before addressing the main concerns, explaining the distress as normal, playing down the problems, changing the topic of discussion, cracking untimely jokes when they are dis listening, opening the mobile watching, talking to your colleague. These are the things which should be avoided. And phrases that can help us is, I'm sorry, I have to tell you this. I know this is not a good news. I wish I had better news for you. To elicit patient's preferences, would you like to have your family when we talk about this? Or to facilitate empathy, I can see how upsetting this is for you. Phrases to avoid, most important. There is nothing more we can do for you. I understand what you're going through. No, we can never understand what the patient or the relatives are going through. Now, the, the uh, difference, uh, diverse uh, setting in the country sh shows what are our challenges in rural setting, poor literacy rate, cultural and social norms related to terminal, and they do not engage with physician discussing psychological stresses and all. That is not a norm in India. And inadequate training and inadequate preparation. What is the solution? You identify the literary level of the patient and talk in the same vernacular language. And if the patient <coughs> chooses his medical proxy, then you can talk to the medical proxy and absolute confidentiality should be maintained. And to improve on this aspect from our side, we can introduce lectures, small group discussion, role play as a part of our clinical training. Most important factor being empathy. Now, how do we debrief the medical team? We can improve our personal and team function constructive discussion of interventions given, things done well, and possible ways to improve. So whenever we discuss, we should always discuss what the team has done the best and what ways we can have improvement. Empathy is emotional understanding while maintaining sufficient separation so that medical skills can be rationally applied to the patient's problem. Uh, a word about death on table. After the death on table, the person who's involved or the team is involved, we start uh, <coughs> self-examination hypercritically and judgmental investigation by the peer group. Everybody is looking at you as though you are the culprit and something wrong has gone. And there is a psychological dis distress with no emotional or professional support. We never support that uh, person who's involved or the team involved. So provision of information. So these are various things that how to provide information to the family when such mishaps occur and criticisms from the peers and the legal action. What legal action will be taken if there is death on table? Sifre said, this is a very important thing that guidelines for risk management strategy. So if there is death on table, you decommission the anesthetic equipment, keep your record updated, debrief of the staff involved. It is very important that the team involved should be debriefed informally instantly after the mishap. Discussion with the relatives needs to be done and then disposal of the body, let the uh, rest of the things can be managed. A word about second victim. We never think, we always think of whatever we have discussed now, we think about it. And then there is other side of the coin that is second victim. Healthcare workers often suffer life altering burdens of anxiety, depression, shame after an adverse patient outcome. Initially, the second victim term used in relation to patient harm after a physician's error. The term has since been expanded to include burden of anxiety because that particular doctor is going to have anxiety, depression, shame all the time. He will always feel that people are looking, my team members are looking at me as though I am the culprit and I've done something wrong. So that traumatic, adverse and unexpected patient care experience is just beyond words and disastrous. So how to help the second victim? What do we do for the uh, second victim who's involved? Emotional first aid provided by the trusted colleague or mentor. We have to be with the uh, second victim. Support by the trained peers. The people who are in the department should be supporting or the friends should be supporting. And if required, support by the mental health professionals should definitely be provided. Otherwise, most of these with the kind of uh, uh, setup we have and the kind of uh, uh, profession we have, they can succumb to alcoholism, drug abuse, and suicide. 
So how do we help them? What are the helpful measures? Informal meeting with members of operating team can be done immediately. Peer review, departmental morbidity, mortality meeting, or critical incident reporting. So there, everybody can discuss what has been done. So then positive things can be discussed. So at least the team and the involved doctor will know that whatever he has done, he has done in a right way. A biggest support to that person. And what improvement can be made because mistakes occur and we have we should be deep thinking so that everybody learns from that person. Clinical governance, members in the team observe the behavior and we keep on observing the person whether the person requires medical help in the future is very, very important. So our outlook towards our colleague should be changing. So formal debriefing, this is mission models, that is a critical incident stress debriefing has to be done. And you have to uh, diffusion of emotions by ventilation and validation of distress within 24 to 72 hours should be done. Temporary halt to OT list can be done. Let the concerned staff discussion the event informally. And then if required, <coughs> the HOD can depute some other team for the OT list, which should not suffer. So what is a, a take home message? Bad news is always a bad news, however well it is said, but the manner in which it is conveyed can have profound effect on both giver and the recipient. Communication skill can be learned through structured training programs, including lectures, small group discussions, and role play. After the catastrophe, provision of support for all the staff members involved who may psychologically traumatize by this potentially distressing event. That is the second bit. Guidelines on how to deal with catastrophe as a part of risk management strategy. Every department or every nursing home or every corporate sector institution should have their risk management strategy where the guidelines are uh, there to how to deal with catastrophe. Debriefing strategies, informal debriefing of staff involved, departmental morbidity, mortality meeting, and critical incident reporting. And most importantly, focus of training in anesthesia should not be concerned only with avoidance of disaster. Rather, it, we should also include management of their aftermath. How we deal when the aftermath occurs. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, ma'am. And. Uh... <laughs> I'm sure this session has come from your heart, you being a gentle soul yourself. And yes, the training should include the aftermath also. Uh, for the next session, uh, we have another reputed speaker. And uh, I'd request uh, Dr. Parul uh, Jindal, uh, one of our colleagues, to please uh, introduce sir. Thank you, Dr. Nishan. I have the honor to invite uh, our next speaker, Dr. Hitendra Sehi Mahajan, who is a consultant anesthesiologist at Ashoka Medicover Hospital, Nasik. His area of interest is neuroanesthesia, regional and trauma anesthesia. Sir has over nine publications on in national journals and three at international at WFSA World Congress, Hong Kong 2016 and Prague 21. He has received Best Paper Award at ISACON 1998 Delhi and Maharashtra ISACON 2012 Kolhapur. He has received the Best Essay Award on Professional Hazards for Analysis Lodges in 2010 and has given presentations at many national and state level conferences and CME. He is the past president of PISA Maharashtra chapter, organizing secretary of ISA, ISACON Maharashtra 2010, appreciation award by Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi ji for race across America and social work for tribal. He has received president appreciation award as ISACON 2014 Madurai and Proficiency Award at ISACON 2017 Ludhiana. He has received the Goda Gaurav Award in 2015 and Dr. Vasant Rao Gupte Award for Social Work in 2015. He has received the Shri Chhatrapati Award for Highest Sports Award by Government of Maharashtra 2017. And at IMA Diamond Jubilee, he has received the IDPL Oration Award by IMA Association 2017-18. He is the first Indian to win world's toughest endurance cycle, race, that is RAM, race across America, 4,860 kilometers in eight days and 14 hours. He's climbed the Mount Everest under Sea to Sky mission with cycling from Mumbai to Kathmandu, a mission dedicated to CPR awareness. So welcome you, sir. Thank you, madam, for those uh, nice words. Uh, respected Vice President, uh, 
अंजलि बुरे मैडम और एवर एंथुजिस्टिक सेक्रेटरी डॉक्टर नवीन मल्होत्रा सर टुडेज होस्ट डॉक्टर निशांत साय एंड ऑल द कलीग्स एंड फ्रेंड्स थैंक यू फॉर दिस अपॉर्चुनिटी इट इज अ एक्सलेंट टॉपिक विच वी आर डिस्कसिंग टूडे विच इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट फॉर अस इन अ डे टू डे प्रैक्टिस एंड वी ऑल शुड बी अवेयर अबाउट यू जस्ट नाउ वन ऑफ अवर प्रीवियस स्पीकर भूरे मैडम हैज टेकन अस फ्रॉम द जर्नी ऑफ हाउ टू डिस्क्लोज द बैड न्यूज वेदर इट इज अ बैड न्यूज ऑफ अ डिसीज और अ बैड न्यूज ऑफ अ डेथ ऑफ अ पेशेंट टू द रिलेटिव वेन इट कम्स टू डिक्लेरिंग द बैड न्यूज बिफोर दैट कैन वी डू समथिंग विच वी विच कैन मेक अवर धिस जर्नी इजी और कैन वी डू समथिंग विच विल मेक इफ एट ऑल वील एंड अप इन अ सिचुएशन वेर वी नीड टू डिक्लेयर दैट विल बिकम इजी yes definitely we can do and that is what uh, depends on how we present ourselves how we communicate with our patients not only when the bad thing happens or not only when but right from the beginning right from the point of first contact with the patient and the relatives and for being an anesthesiologist for us it is nothing but a pre anesthesia check up psc so right from that point you can build up this this is not something this is a, a relation which gets developed though it may be for a day or a two days or a few days but then every second in this relation matters every moment every word what you say every second uh, you spend time with them though it may be a small it matters a lot and that forms the building block for your final stages of revealing maybe it is a good news or a bad news or taking them into the confidence so i am going to talk about and it etiquities so this all this thing in one word if you want to put like our communication or presentation our uh, talk with the that not only goes with how we communicate with the patient but how we present them how we follow small small things while our behavior during the psc in the ot in the corridor and how we deal with the patient not only with our words but with our actions and that is what is uh, called as etiquette i'd like to share my screen to start with my presentation yeah uh, is, is my screen visible yes sir yeah and uh, my sound is uh, properly audible yes sir you are audible sir thank you so we are discussing today operation theater etiquette i bring lot of greetings to every one of you from the city of nasik where we have a isa monument i say island and my hospital ashoka medical which is a 350 bedded corporate hospital where i am heading the department so my flow of the talk will be we'll see what exactly is etiquette why it is important for operation theater though etiquette is expected from everyone whether we are in our professional uh, life or whether we are in a personal or social life but when it comes to ot it matters a lot and being a professional where we spend maximum time in operation theater it becomes very important for us to follow them know them and follow them and then what exactly is ethical aspect and legal aspect i'll just touch this in the last because this is also equally important and that is directly related with our etiquettes so what exactly is etiquette if you go in a you know, by a dictionary uh, definition or a meaning it is a customary code in which we need to behave politely and it apply it, it as i said it applies to all the profession and anesthesiologist is no exception to it it helps us to uh, it helps us to be thoughtful about our behavior and conduct in the operation theater how we behave how we what happens we for us it becomes a day to day activity day to day life and we get carried away in that but we, it's our responsibility that we should remind ourselves now yes i am no more a ordinary person or i am no more just a doctor i am a anesthesiologist and i am in a premises which is called operation theater and certain type of behavior is expected from me this we need to imbibe in ourselves this we need to remind ourselves the moment we step in the operation theater daily on every day basis and third thing is this etiquette is makes us aware about the feelings and rights of others it is not only we who is working or i who is working in that operation theater there are apart from patient there are 
colleagues who are also working with the same aims and objective so the colleagues may be dog anyone doctor ward boys you know nurses the ot staff those who are helping you the uh, technical staff so my behavior with them also equally matters because we all work together with one agenda that is to keep the patient safe and comfortable so why we should follow ot equity it is a fundamental requirement of any profession and as i said anesthesiologist it is very important for us to follow it patient when they hand over you know you may imagine a patient uh, allowing it to give anesthesia that means that patient has handed over his entire body to you entire physiology to you and that is with the trust and expectation that his journey in the operative perioperative period will be smooth and pleasant and that's why it becomes very important for us to maintain that ethical standard which are very high any misunder misconducts on our side can cause a great harm to patient always remember this that whatever we do it may be a silly mistake but then since we are taking the control of entire physiology of the patient it can cause a great harm it can cause a permanent damage or it may even cause a life for the patient so never 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 forget that we deal with a confidential issues apart from life and death and physiology and pathology there are certain issues like confidentiality issues they are very important directly related with the people's lives history behavior being a doctor we expect them to reveal everything at the same time in return patient expects that whatever i am going to tell to my patient remains confidential and it becomes our obligation our responsibility to keep it confidential any breach in this confidentiality can cause a devastating effects on the patient so it can shake his confidence and entire it's not only confidence about you and your patients it's confidence about patients and profession so one should be very careful we must know and maintain a high level of ethical standards when we talk about ot etiquettes it will be very uh, um, easy for me to explain if i divide it into three broad classification one is we will, when we we will talk about ourselves as an anesthesiologist what we should uh, inculcate in our behavior then our uh, etiquette is towards patient and then of course our colleagues so in this under this three headings i like to go ahead first coming to etiquette is towards myself being an anesthesiologist whenever you step in a ot your actions are going to matter a lot as we see that how many times i am entering ot i am coming out of the ot i am changing i am you know so these things matter so plan it when you are planning to go in a operation theater for 8 hours see to it that you don't need any other things in that 8 hours you don't have to come out for small small silly things so planning becomes very important before going have you adequate breakfast meal whatever you are used to it hydrate yourself properly that is very important empty your bladder before you change to scrub suit which is also very important and then wear proper scrub suit which is uh, you know which it is the first step primary step towards the sterility towards you know providing patient the sterile uh, atmosphere cap covering hair and mask we we sometime you know we have in a hurry we just put the cap in our uh, on our head or just wear the mask tight somehow no it's very important that you take the uh, pay the attention towards small small things like whether hairs are completely covered if you see various studies a hair fall we keep on shedding the hairs we don't realize but then each hair carries a lot of germs and that can be a cause of communicating the infection to the patient so we don't want that to happen our hair should be properly covered in case of females there is a ponytail and all not like this but it has to be completely covered under the cap and mask has to be properly covering not only your mouth but nose uh, properly and it should tied in such a way that it should not keep on slipping now and then and you need to touch it and keep it up you know so um, if we take <clears throat> due importance if you give it a due importance while tying them and wearing they don't trouble you later on then no orm ornaments like bangles rings and all one should be very careful even wristwatch and everything we should see to it that we are keeping it securely uh, outside in the locker or wherever it is possible 
Footwear are very important from two points of view. Footwear which we wear when we enter in OT complexes and then from there changing area to actual OT area where we enter. There also we should see to it that we are changing the footwear. Footwear should be there is two purpose of footwear one is to obviously prevent carrying germs along with us and second purpose is protecting our own uh, foot that is also equally important from falling up the sharp instrument on uh, needles as stepping up on the needles or sometimes glass part glass particles are there on the floor so that's why you should always have a good quality footwear which is breathable not the one shown on right it this has got a lot of openings and also preferably have a, those which are covered from top and having a side breathing uh, apertures then introduce yourself to the patient the moment you go to near to the patient even though even though you had met the patient during the pse in spite of that because during the pse you may be in a different attire you may be in a you, you may not be wearing cap and mask and you may be in a civilian dress so it may be difficult for a patient to recognize so introduce yourself tell them hello i am the same person uh, who has seen you yesterday in during the pre and that that you know that helps in recatching that bond which we had created during the PSE. It always helps to develop that habit of you know telling the patient that I'm so and so and I had seen you yesterday and then we had a, this discussion and that gives reassurance to the patient and that definitely acts as a, any anxiolytic drug will act even if you are done PSE. So uh, go through the patient's medical record again. Whatever you had written previous day, never hesitate. It may be a, just an exercise, but it is always better. Sometimes some point we may miss because we not we don't only see one patient, we see many patients. So it's always a good habit to going through the medical records before starting. Then scrubbing technique. Very, very important in the scrubbing technique. We should have a, I'm fortunate that in our theater, we have a timer also. Whenever we start the tap, it runs for two minutes and then we can properly focus and concentrate on uh, taking the soap from automatic dispenser. As far as possible, a number of studies have shown that hand cleanliness matters a lot. And believe me friends, in spite of taking all the precautions while washing still, still remember that your hands are clean but not sterile so wearing a sterile gown over the scrub suit after washing and then properly wearing gloves very important i've seen many of our colleagues they wear gown everything and then they take the gloves and they touch the gloves at 10 different points so there is proper technique of learn that technique of wearing untouched technique of wearing the gloves that will go long way in preventing infections then who has given us an excellent checklist never 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 hesitate though it may appear sometime funny though it may appear sometime you know uh, odd for you but never hesitate to loudly go through surgical safety checklist we being the anesthesiologist you know it becomes easy for us to coordinate the surgeon the sister on a trolley who has uh, laid the trolley the mop count the gauze count whether we are prepared whether we know from anesthesia point of view yes my blood is ready i had kept the difficult intubation trolley ready fine but what about after induction if you realize that one of the surgical instrument is missing what your entire efforts can go uh, in when so have a good communication open up that go through the safety checklist it uh, initially you may find that it is taking five minutes but later on uh, as you keep on doing it subsequently it takes not more than one minute our mobile phone nowadays it has it is becoming though there is a lot of discussion which happens whether it is a boon or a ban whether it should be allowed or should not be allowed the problem is not with the mobile phone the problem is how we use it there is always good side and bad side of each and everything definitely at the finger of tips we have a knowledge we can watch any block video we can deal with any situation we you can you need not learn the other uh, guidelines or you don't have to learn the steps of you know you can just go through them on a mobile that is a benefit but at the same time you should remember that it should be only case related there should not be a social chit chat or something apart from you know that that is not a problem it, it creates a bad environment it creates a, it loses the confidence between you and the patient it 
it is it shows that how casual you are at that place so all these things your body language reflects all these things which goes to the patient if patient is under the regional anesthesia and i don't think even the surgeon and even the ot staffs definitely they will not like to have you keep it on a silent and uh, even keypad, uh, this thing should be silent. You should be that much, uh, you know, you should give the importance to the silence in the OT. And then another thing with the having mobile in your hand, there is always a fear of breaking the confidentiality. Please remember, never, never try to keep on clicking photographs, whether they are selfie or whether they are of patient, whether they are of equipment, because that sends a wrong signal to the patient. If at all you need to click, a, um, picture of a patient operation or whatever it is for your scientific reason it has to be properly informed to the patient properly consent taken and while clicking the photo also you tell them yes I, as per our discussion i'm taking the photograph of your fit or your wound or something like that which is going to be a confidential in which your identity will never be revealed once you take him or her again into a confidence the patient remains relaxed and then you can keep on clicking the photographs with your mobile phone sterility as i mentioned is very important uh, we should be uh, after wash or whatever it is in the ot develop the habit of frequently taking sterlium on your hand you know because we keep on touching here and there or mobile itself carries a lot of germs then there are other stuff definitely which is uh, uh, not totally preventable but the best habit is keep on taking the um, uh, disinfectant on your hands and that can go long way to prevent the infection never ever touch green or in some theater it is a blue and if at all if at all inadvertently if you touch something never hesitate to accept and reveal it because rectifying at that stage is going to be always helpful but if you hide you always remember that you are playing with the life of a patient it can lead to a from minor to major infection septicemia in which patient can die apart leave apart from in prolonging his icu stay or something like that and even the expenses will go up so one small silly mistake accepting and rectifying at the proper time can prevent all the future this thing then patient's interest is foremost important always see to that as i have said in the beginning patient has handed over his body his entire you know physically and mentally to you that means you need to put yourself in a patient's place and that is the easiest way to do that just imagine yourself if i am lying on this table how i expect others to behave or how i am I would like my body to be on this table. Which part will trouble me? Which part will not trouble me? What should be the position of my hand? Simple thing, we just pull the hand rest back like this. Imagine this is not a normal position. Within one minute, it will cause pain to me. So whether I had given a good analgesia to the operative side, it will not matter because one hour hand like this and next three, four days, this will pain to the patient. So little flexion to the shoulder, little flexion at the elbow, protection of the nerve. This is our responsibility. This comes under our uh, behavior and equity. Always respect, be faithful and truthful to the patient. Always respect their wish. Involve them in a decision making, which anesthesia to be given. If you ask me which is the uh, absolute contraindication for regional anesthesia the first and foremost is we know a number of least medical lists but patients refusal is the first and foremost thing. so involve them in a decision making take their wish because after all you can you can explain them what are the you know pros and cons and everything but after all it is his wish anesthetize patient ensure comfort ensure the maintenance of their dignity even if they are anesthetized physical and psychological both the way it is not like oh patient is anesthetized so just we should just you know um, take out the sheets or something like that no avoid that thing because there is something called as dignity of each patient which becomes our responsibility as an anesthesiologist to maintain it perfect uh, protect from disrespectful and abusive behavior of colleagues it happens you may find this exaggerated but there are always chances of abuse and disrespectful behavior in a theater be vigilant be watchful and if you find it with the slightest or if you have a slightest of doubt raise your alarm and immediately point it and prevent it confidentially as already mentioned assure post anesthesia care right from the beginning 
tell the patient that our relation is not only during anesthesia and surgery after that also i'm going to take look after you look after your pain look after your needs so just be relaxed and this assurance can go long way and that has should not be related with the financial ability or inability of the patient whether patient is paying whether patient is from general ward whether patient is from any scheme for us for OT etiquities tell us that it remains same it never differentiates between the various financial status of the patient inform consent is very important inform the patient return take return consent inform the relatives properly uh, reasonable and clear explanation should be given regarding the procedure never never hesitate to give the clear explanation because if you had given the clear explanation may the untoward incidents happens may the complication happens later on it will make you it will help to make your life smooth and easy and if patient does not in, in, in india it is very common that patient may not wish to have a detailed description of his diseases you know he may wish don't 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 tell me i don't was I'm, I'm just i believe you know they immediately they start saying i believe in you and you do whatever you feel like don't tell me all these. I mean, that is quite natural that is acceptable it may happen so just take one informed consent that yes i don't wish to get revealed about my diseases no problem take like that consent take the patient's signature and then explain it to the relative there is no harm in doing that now let me come to some ethical issues which is very important which we take for a granted in this legally we are correct but ethically and morally we may not be correct most of the time you must have noticed there are ot gowns which patients are expected to wear either from ward in small hospital or from a room or even from a recovery room and their journey starts from there and the poor lady they the gown is not enough to cover properly and it is you know exposing their parts they are not at that particular situation they are not bothered about what you are talking what surgery uh, it is happening uh, they are not bothered about all those things and they are bothered about so it, is, it becomes our responsibility if put in that situation am i like to walk leave apart the females even being a male i will never like to walk like that in a corridor with a half open gown so see to it that you are keeping special sheets along with those which are used only in the operation theater and just give those sheets also which patient can you know cover themselves with those and go up to the ot door or see to it that if they are on a bed or a trolley they are covered properly apart from the uh, gown like uh, it is uh, in the OT itself also matters a lot. Once the patient is on an OT table, that doesn't mean that we have a right to expose him the way we want. No. Every step should be communicated properly. Everywhere you tell them, yes, I am uh, applying a chest lead and for that I need to remove the bed sheet. Tell them and look at their eyes during such actions and there will be a good uh, communication rapport which will de develop and that confidence will develop and they will re in a relaxed fashion they will allow you to do keep communicating every step what you are doing be careful even assure them that when you will be taking them out after completing the surgery you will be covering them you will be making them wear all the clothes tell them like this and see that one sentence of assurance will make a lot of difference and it will, it will definitely reduce the drugs required to control the tachycardia. So these are small, small things which will make a lot of uh, difference. Most of the time there is exposure is unnecessary. So avoid that. What matters a lot apart from that is a number of people in the theater. Often there are a lot of people which are not necessary at every stage. So see to it that being an anesthesiologist, take a lead during induction. I don't want this many people here. Be strict about that. Yes, once the induction is finished, rest of the people can come and join. So look at this now. You, do you expect a patient to be comfortable with so many people surrounding and when there are many people surrounding patient in an operation theater you cannot restrict what they are communicating between each other and especially in a theater where two three cases are going on uh, one after another you cannot expect staff to be you know very much vigilant so there are chances that we may start chatting unnecessary things and there to avoid all these things best thing is to allow required the minimum number of people in the theater privacy during positioning preparation is very important give due importance to it 
take out only whatever is necessary these are some patients dress which are you know easily available and they have a velcro to cover and we can expose only the parts which are required noise is something which can make many people annoyed patients coming to ot are worried need privacy silence reassurance so noise of our discussion noise of you know someone shouting oh get me the drill get me this get me that or oh, this get the drum from the uh, cssd this noises also can disturb to the patient because he's he's not knowing what exactly and he's just imagining what must be happening to me now machines making noise if at all patient is under regional anesthesia and you are going to use the drill tell them yes this is a drill these are the instrument you may hear these noises you may not so once you tell them once you reassure them that will definitely go long way in accepting them that what it is expected what is going to come now and that will keep them relax sight as far as possible try to avoid this sight of you know lead trolley with a big instrument and all this thing no one loves to see that so just see to it that it is covered properly that will serve two purpose one is it will hide it from the patient sight and second thing is it will keep it covered and sterile as long as possible and expose only when it is required on the patient's comments and behavior we are, we we don't realize we become mechanical in the operation theater especially if you are doing eight to ten operations in a day and that time we keep on discussing we don't realize that we are standing in front of patient suddenly one of our colleague comes up and he starts talking asking us about some other patients and we casually pass some remarks but we forget that the patient who is on the trolley or whom we are handling now he is also listening or she is also listening and what interpretation she or he may carry with that it may be a lighter moment for us but definitely not for the patient so we need to be very careful you can just say yes you go in a doctor's lounge i will join you shortly where we can discuss and then once you are in doctor's lounge you can uh, resume your communication and you can do that examining a patient we are in a habit of you know immediately go we in a recovery room start examining there is other patient lying on another bed sometimes there but be little vigilant see to it that the curtains provided are pulled before you examine just before taking the patient to the operation theater then be patient at all the time never be in a hurry sometime you may get irritated oh, what is this he is not giving position what is this so don't get irritated give them their own time it may be a daily routine for you as an anesthesiologist or any staff in the working in the operation theater but that patient is most of the time coming for the first time not expecting what is happening and some patients are not that you know strong enough they need their own time to get adjusted with the new environment supervise subordinates very important try to maintain religious sentiment as much as possible being in india we have a, we, we have a patients with different different religions each religion has their, has got their own sentiments it is it is our responsibility to see to it that we try to follow as much as possible not in a legal framework but even in a ethical framework just try to question is it really mandatory or shall shall i do it or is it going to help me if it is not and if it is going to help patient in a sentiment religious sentiment avoid it no problem nothing will happen but it will keep your patient calm and never try to bill a patient for services not rendered if you had not put a central line don't mention it if you have not done something don't mention it in corporate hospital or most of the hospital every action the billing is separate so that is also one of the good equity be honest to the patient if at all something went wrong take them in a confidence complications can happen in a medical practice and most of the time if you see a medical legal problems arising out of any complication they were just most of the time they are for hiding the complication not for making the complications so hiding never never helps in long term that is what at least i believe there are unexpected incidences which happens and if we are honest with the patient initially we may have face have to face the grunt but after all it is a indian mentality and then they say then even they start talking our language oh no my doctor has taken a lot of but my it was my bad luck or something and that is what you know but then we need to build up like that from right from the beginning to see the if at all they see any question mark in our face they'll catch it very fast and then the that distress will never get settled and it will definitely get you to the court of the law towards our colleagues 
it is very important there should be a cooperation and respect in the interest of the patient if some colleague needs your help or if you need some colleagues help never hesitate to call or never hesitate to help your colleague seek or provide timely uh, consultation never hesitate to take the opinion reeducate or rehabilitate you academically to yourself as well as your colleague if at all he needs some academic help provide him provide the knowledge provide the time you yourself if you feel i need to do this read about it follow it or ask it to your senior keep that honesty among your colleague as well and there should not be a financial exploitation let me tell in i'm just at the end of my talk where i'd like to mention difference between ethical and legal this thing ethical is something moral principle that governs our behavior and conduct in the life it is something which allows us to maintain equity in the premises if we do it it is always respected on the humanitarian ground if you don't do it there is no one going to you know catch hold of you or say because legally you may be correct but ethically you may not be correct and what are the legal things legal applies to what is sanctioned by law or in conformity with the law so it is from the law point of view it may be wrong or may maybe not be wrong so the, when we talk about ethical and legal ethics and the law are not identical legal standards are based on written law written said that this is legal this is illegal while ethical standards are based on human rights and wrong what is right and what is wrong you need to just put the question mark if i am a patient is this thing i will call it as a right or a wrong you are part it may be legal for a doctor to do certain thing but if i am as a patient whether it will be a ethical try to answer that question you will find the answer in yourself and try to behave accordingly that will help you a lot there is a very thin margin there is a very thin overlap between the uh, but sometime it may overlap and there we need to use our senses and you, we need to behave legal has its basis in ethics while ethics has its basis in morals and if your morals are very strong you will always 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 uh, be a good anesthesiologist in the theater coming to the conclusion be competent and prudent anesthesiologist follow the protocols and guidelines provide proper standard of care in short etiquette is an ethics not only helps to deliver proper care to the patients giving them maximum satisfaction because nowadays if you ask me what is the standard of anesthesia if you want to standardize it is ultimately patient satisfaction which matters and that is what is standardization of anesthesia so if we follow etiquette is in the ot if we go ethically it will not only help us to deliver the safe anesthesia but to the maximum patient satisfaction and at the same time it will keep all the legal hassles away so be ethical professional and stay happy thank you very much this is beautiful city of nasik which from which i belong thank you very much thank you so much sir thank you so much sir may i ask dr nishant to take over for our third speaker yes uh, thank you dr parul and uh, thank you dr majan sir wonderful lecture and uh, i mean uh, this is an opportunity to thank you sir we are exceptionally proud of uh, what you have been doing from uh, mumbai to kathmandu 6000 kilometers on the cycle my goodness so for the next speaker uh, we have dr divya gupta ma'am and uh, she is a professor at the department of anesthesiology at uh, oh, sorry yeah at the himalayan institute of medical sciences uh, in dehradun uttarakhand she has many national and international conference lectures and a peer review of the indian journal of anesthesiology Uh, she has inter she is an international affiliate of the Royal College of Anesthesiologists, scholar of the WFSA of in 2021, and scholar of World Congress Epidemiology 2021. She was selected for Fellow of International Medical Sciences Academy and a member of the NAMS, the National Academy of Medical Sciences, executive member of the Dehradun Society of Anesthesiologists, the DSA, and uh, she received the President Appreciation Award of uh, Indian Anesthesiologist. Uh, in 2018 and uh, she was the scientific committee in charge of the uttarakhand isocon 2017 in dehradun she was selected for the cops award she won the second prize in the poster presentation uh, in the uttarakhand isocon 2012 in dehradun and a certificate of appreciation by impact india foundation 
Uh, she has membership of uh, the ISA, ICA, AOA, IAPA, IEA, ISMS, and uh, IN Clin. More than 20 uh, publications uh, in national and international journals with an H index of 3 and I10 of 2. And uh, her areas of interest are pediatric anesthesia, research, community awareness, and social outreach program for anesthesia. So over to you, Madam, and a very important talk on non-verbal communication, uh, which has been stressed by Dr. Anjali Ma'am and Dr. Hitendra sir also. So uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Nishan. First of all, I would like to thank the National ISA headquarters for giving me this opportunity and this platform to speak on such an important topic, which is though important, but forsaken and need to be taken care of. Uh, is my slides visible? Yes, ma'am. Uh, and I'm, uh, okay. You are audible. And I would, okay, thank you so much, Dr. Nishan. And thank you, uh, our honorary secretary, Dr. Emil Motra, sir, and our vice president, ma'am, Anjali Pure, ma'am, who has guided me through this uh, lecture and has always supported me. So, first of all, to begin with, blessings from Dev Bhubi Uttarakhand, the land of gods where I belong to and my institute, Himalayan Institute of Medical Sciences. So what is communication? Of all the life skills available to us, communication is perhaps the most empowering. That is truly a true sentence as said by Mr. Brett Morrison. So what is communication? It is derived from the Latin word communicare, meaning to share, to begin in relation with, to impart and to participate. So the communication is defined as transferring information to produce greater understanding. It is mainly exchange of information between two peers. They can be patient on the other side or the attendants or our colleagues, our seniors, our juniors, our students. So coming on to the types of communication, it is done vocally through verbal exchanges as is said as verbal communication, that is the most important aspect, what we converse, that is what we say, that is that forms what we are communicating by our words. There is an exchange of information between two people. It is done via written media, that is books, websites, magazines, written communication. How is it important, especially in anesthesiology, as we do documentation, as they say, if it is not written, it is not done. So that is also one important aspect of written communication. Coming on to the visual communication, it is usually visually uh, using the charts, graphs, cards, or any magazines, especially as we deal with kids, we can show them those cards, those funny alphabets, so as to divert them. So that is also one form of communication between us and the patient. Coming on to the most important and today's topic that is non-verbally, that is our body language, gestures, voice, that form the most important aspect of non-verbal communication. So we, the anesthesiologist, what is our perspective? As we all are aware, it is a high-risk speciality, but the public at large is still not aware of the risk involved in anesthesia because they say there is not much scope for interaction between us and patient. So we are able to have a limited rapport between the patient and us. So how can we avoid this? How can we avoid it by our good communication skills? We only have to come forward to them to make them realize what important role we are playing and no surgery is possible without us. We have to have followed this thumb rule. First of all, we should listen carefully to the patient. That is why God has given us one mouth to speak, but two ears to listen. So that we patiently listen to the patient or to the attendant so that he or she should feel completely important. We should keep it short. It should not be like we are giving him the details, the unnecessary details to which the patient is not interested as well as it is not relevant for him. We should ask questions to the patient. Is he able to understand what we are saying? What the purpose of our talk is? Is he able to grasp it, what, what we mean to say? We should have a complete check on our body language. That is what, how we sit, what is our facial expression, our gestures, 
and in the end we should always play back and summarize that what we are trying to say has he perceived it correctly so that can be done only and only if we say that we have said so are you able to perceive it that way otherwise confusions occur and it may lead to disasters so the golden rule is seven c's of communication clear we should be very clear in what we want to say we should be crystal clear the patient and the attendant or the other side person should be able to grasp the point what we mean to say we should be concise and short as anjali ma'am also said that we have to be very precise we should not tell them long stories they are even not interested even time does not permit us so we have to be very concise and to the point we have to be concrete that means it should be based on medical facts hawa mein baat karne se nahi hoga patient bhi aajkal they are all aware of it today is the world of social media they know more than they know more than us they say agar spinal hum lagwayenge to hame ye problem ho sakti hai ye complication ho sakti hai so our information should be concrete it should be correct we should be telling them properly that this is the scenario either you want regional anesthesia or general anesthesia regarding the prognosis of the patient we should be very coherent we should be able to say what we are saying we are the patient is able to perceive the same thing it should be complete it is not that humne bata diya that we are going to give you regional anesthesia but we have not told the patient that what impact he will have immediately he will have numbness of the limb otherwise the patient will feel uncomfortable he will say mujhe bataya gaya tha kamar mein sui lagayi jayegi but mujhe ye nahi bataya gaya ki uske baad mujhe numbness hogi and even i was not aware that for four after four to six hours the normal power will come so our information should be complete courteous courteous as we should be respectful to the patient he or she should not feel that he is not a doctor we should bring it, bring ourselves to that level that he feel ki yeah we are giving respect to that patient so this slide is very important because this summarizes the most of it effective communication skills we start with verbal communication we communicate in form of words the patient is speaking and we are actively listening to the patient we are documenting each and everything because communication of documentation and documentation of communication is what isa has said in its guidelines non verbal communication you should have a check on how you speak your body language also your presentation skills definitely matter the first impression is last impression that is what they say agar doctor se koi milta hai to uska first impression kya hota hai the way he or she presents himself or herself to that patient or to that person so presentation skills are also very important patient education our main aim is what to educate the patient educate in the sense what we want to deliver what what information we want to give him or her we should be compassionate we should have cultural awareness if we have some language barriers as for example some elderly is come they are not able to understand hindi as we belong to i mean we are staying in garhwal area dehradun so some garhwali patients come if we speak to them in hindi they are not able to converse but if we ask our support staff to con- help us converse in garhwali they feel connected this cultural barrier is very important otherwise if they don't feel connected they will not have trust in you personal connection you should say ha aisa hota hai so they should feel ki i am not the one who is suffering i mean it is i am not the one who is having this for the first time this will land up into trust and rapport of the patient which usually lags between us and the, between us as anesthesiologists and the patient so this is very very important coming on to the major part that is the non verbal communication which i'll be dealing in detail so what is a non verbal communication it is a communication without words as the name itself suggests and it is a process of communication through sending and receiving wordless messages as anjali ma'am also said that 93% of communication occurs through non verbal behavior and tone and only 7% is what we say through words and even in that 93% it is further broken down into 38% of our voice the tone of our voice and 55% of our body language so there are three important components of communication that is language which makes only 7% the paralanguage which is 38% paralanguage means 
the way we are speaking the tone our voice and the body language the way we present ourselves coming on to each one of it in a uh, short while para language it is the way in which you say words your volume if it is too loud the patient might get scared that we are about to pressurize that person our pitch it should not be shrill it should not be sharp it should be very docile dormant and very comfortable to the patient to the ears also speaking rate if we speak da 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 our speaking rate is very important that means the patient or the peers understand if we are speaking it so fast that means we are trying to hide something speaking rate should not be like a racing car it should be very comfortable and at a normal pace and your voice quality it should be soothing and comfortable because they say not only what you say that is important but how you say it is also matters coming on to the further uh, uh, parallel uh, further components of non verbal communication that is facial expression gestures posture proxemics chronemics haptics oculistic and handshakes so i'll be dealing with each one of them first of all the patient comes to us he sees us that is our facial expressions he perceives us whether we are happy sad that gives an impression whether we are interested in the patient or not so our facial expression is very important these are the various expressions which we can see the face is the index of mind the patient or the peers are not bothered how night what type of problem you are having or how was the night duty whether you are tired did you have your meal and all no they just want you to have at a comfortable pace with them so your facial expression should be like this that they should feel that they are important then your gestures your hand movements they also matter a lot few hand movements they show confidence that yes you can gain confidence with the patient few hand movements that means you are in a relaxed position sitting trustworthy if you do like this that means the patient will have trust in you and if you are giving him strength so our hand movements our gestures also form a very important part of see one more aspect is very important we should never never ever point our finger towards the patient he or she might feel offended so our gestures our hand movements should be always taken care all throughout the course of our communication with the patient body language posture the way we are sitting in a relaxed way whether we are defensive we are arrogant whether we are annoyed this all is judged by your each movement the way you are sitting on the chair you are standing you are in a hurry as man said that you cannot say you cannot just speak on uh, in the corridor and say okay ho jayega so that all it matters at each aspect of it appearance they are also called as artifacts the way how we present ourselves we should be neat tidy well groomed even though being as an anesthesiologist we hardly able to get a chance to deck up well as in ot we are mostly in the ot dress but still we should take care like tattoos jewelry they all and beard they all should be taken care of and the patient should feel comfortable he or she should not feel that a doctor is not good looking i mean i mean to say you are have to have presentable and always always come out with a smile no you are not fully dressed until you wear a smile so a smiling face clears it all and you win the battle coming on to proxemics the study of spatial communication where the person is standing that is very very important they have been defined into four spaces the intimate space that is less than 1.5 feet the personal space intimate space it is taken only and only by your family your husband your children personal space 1.5 to 4 feet that is taken care of i mean the friends enter into this area and the social space which usually the strangers 4 feet to 12 feet and public space is beyond 12 feet so patients attendants or the patient per se they feel that if they come too close to you they are able to tell you or share with you the problem but you feel uncomfortable but that discomfort should not be visible on your face you can just say aap thoda idhar se baat kariye main aapki baat sun pa raha hu ya sun pa rahi hu never ever make him feel uncomfortable but 
even your personal space, your special communication is also very important. So this also is to be taken care of. Coming on to haptics or tactilic, haptics that includes communication with the help of touch. As we all are aware that touch therapy is the best therapy. It includes handshakes, holding hands, high five we, we can give to the kids. Kids, you take them in and you say you'd give them high five then. They are much more comfortable. And a pat on the shoulder. That also. You can see this all, but as all, all of us would have seen this movie, Munna Bhai MBBS, regarding Jadu Ki Jhappi, but with a word of caution as in this, you have to have gender, gender consideration. I mean, a male doctor cannot hug a female doctor like that. And this nowadays, because of the COVID pandemic, this will not be acceptable also. But to be on the lighter side, this also really soothes the patient or the attendant. Eye contact. Eye contact is very important. Why? Because until unless you are seeing at the eyes of the patient, patient feels that you are not listening to him. Patient or the attendants feel that you are distracted. You are giving, you are not giving him importance. So this is very important that you need to have an eye contact. He waits till Jack's eyes look because Jack is ready to listen. We have to make them feel that yes, we are listening to you. As in Malampati grading, we all are aware what we do. We say that our eyes should be at the level of the mouth of the patient, isn't it? So in the similar way, our eyes should be at the level of the eyes and we should have an eye to eye contact. Chronomics. What is chronomics? Chronomics is the time management. As I said, our information, it should be short and concise. The amount of time we spend talking, that is also to be taken care of. The time and status, where we are talking, how we are talking, how much time we are talking, what we are going to tell him or her. The cultural time, as I told, cultural consideration also to be maintained. And whether you are talking formally or informally. Chromatics, colors. They definitely have an impact on us. How we dress, as we all know, red color, these are the multiple colors which signify a particular thing. Like red signifies danger, alertness. White signifies serenity, purity, and blue, calmness. That is why we all anesthesiologists usually have blue OT dresses, isn't it? Coming on to another aspect, silence and pause. As we all are aware, silence does wonders. Silence is more eloquent than words. We should know when we have to be silent. Why? Because if we keep on speaking and if the other person is speaking, we have to be silent. And if we are silent, we are able to tell him or her the seriousness about the thing. And it is said that it is true wisdom's best reply. What we are not able to say in words if we are silent, we are able to tell him or her the importance of it, isn't it? Coming on to the pause, the right word made effective, but no word can be as effective as a rightly timed pause. As we can see in this example, sorry. Let's eat, grandma. If we say like this, we are inviting grandma for eating. But if we say, let's eat, grandma, that means, are we trying to eat, grandma? Or in simple words, Hindi mein bolte hai, Roko mat jane do. Roko mat jane do. So those pauses are very important. They stress out the things and the feelings and the effect of it, isn't it? So learning to pause and respond rather than react is crucial in effective communication. And a beautiful mnemonic which I found to learn about the nonverbal communication is COPAC, that is kinesics, that is the movements, the gestures, oculistic, our eye contact, proximate, our spatial communication, para language, our tone of voice, our artifacts, appearance, chronomics, time management, and tactilic, that is touch therapy. Coming on to anesthesiologists, we are playing multi cadre role. Not only at the patients and attendants level, we talk and have communication with our peers and colleagues. Whenever we are in a difficult case, be it difficult intubation or be it a complicated case, we discuss with our seniors, juniors, colleagues. So at that time also our communication skills matter. If we are gentle and humble to the person, then only he or she will be ready to help you out. So communication skills are at every step of our life. 
if we are even with the team members be it surgeons nursing staff and other departments also if we take them into confidence if we are in a complicated case then if we take the surgeon into confidence then we are safe otherwise if we don't then we might be in a fix and nowadays we are also dealing with students we are giving medical education to our post graduates interns and even undergraduates there also communication skills matter how because how we are able to present them how we are able to tell them we are able to make them understand what is the importance of anesthesia so that is what is very important and the evolving role is community outreach building bridges of hope now anesthesiologists are coming out of the four walls of ot rooms now they are coming out to the community they want as isa has started this public awareness program that people are totally unaware about us they know the surgeon they know everybody else but they don't know how the surgeon is able to do the surgery because of anesthesiologists because of us so we only have to reach to them they will not be aware because they come to the hospital with the name of the surgeon so we have to come to them make them understand what is the importance of anesthesia and how we can help them out not only in surgery but also in pain even in other aspects so our contact times are very limited we meet them at pre anesthetic clinic we ask them history develop a rapport then we post them for surgery then pre operatively a day before surgery we visit we communicate them again what will be our plan of anesthesia we communicate them that they have to be npo so communication is at that time also even in pre op area we confirm it sometimes we document it but we don't tell the patient to be npo then in the morning they come that aapne to hame bataya nahi tha we have documented but we have not conveyed it to them so that is very important conveying the orders is also very important so communicating to the patient is important even in the intra operative period if we are if we make the patient comfortable if he is in spinal anesthesia or if he is in mass then if we make him comfortable then his compliance will be better he will be able to tolerate the surgery as well as anesthesia well in the post op period we should be always following up the patient for the post op complication i mean the side effects of regional anesthesia general anesthesia like we should uh, ask them and tell them beforehand also that after general anesthesia you might have sore throat so if they are aware they will be receptive but but they should be told about it beforehand expanding horizons as a told that we are coming out of our os we are taking care of emergency department suddenly a patient comes of trauma with a mob and we as anesthesiologists we are alone in the duty how to handle them we have to take care of the patient as well as of the mob because they are at outrage they are in anger they are in distress so there also how we handle them how we maintain our uh, communication skills with them we quieten them we listen to them we have to be empathetic to them then only the things will work out critical care personnel we have to timely inform them about the prognosis of the patient the improvement or the deterioration of the patient and video consenting these days is very important because sometimes we are in a fix we have told them they have understood but we don't have a proof so nowadays there is a concept of video consent also then nora we are giving our services to each and every department of the hospital be it onco department be it pediatric department radio department ct mri so everywhere and there so we don't have any support ot backup so there our rapo our building up of rapo with that patient or attendant only will save us medical education nmc has declared two weeks posting of third year part 1 in our ot nowadays as mandatory clinical posting and even interns it is no more optional now it is mandatory so at that time also our communication with them and making them aware how they can communicate and improvise themselves is very important and as i discussed that community outreach program we are now becoming community physicians peri operative to community physicians mandatory arena as we all are aware that cpr even be it bls acls guidelines given by aha or coles guidelines given by our national society irc initiative of isa they all are dependent on one important rule that is closed loop communication the sender initiates the message and the receiver receives it and he or she gives back the confirmation that yes i have received it so this is very important otherwise you say he did but he has not responded back to you that yes he has done it
so you're not sure of it isn't so we have to have and these closed loop communication is not only limited to cpr or bls guidelines but also in ot we have to be loud enough that whether this drug has been given or not so in the words of terry kennel the patient will never care how much you know they know how much you care that is what is important and the art of anesthesia is reliant on professionalism and a significant part of that is communication that is why the need of the hour recognizing the importance of communication the american society of anesthesiologists has charged the community on communication to improve public education as it relates to anesthesiology so our vision is good communication is as important in protecting professional integrity as it is to patient safety and satisfaction so communication and in that non verbal communication plays a major role we should never overlook it be it facial expression be it body language be it our gestures touch eye contact or the personal space so communication is the human connection which is the key to professional and personal success and it is just we if you just communicate you can get it but if you communicate skillfully you can work miracle and non verbal communication we speak only with our mouths but we communicate with our whole bodies so the take home message is the mission is we should effectively communicate with each other and communication skills are the key to success long live isa jai ism thank you thank you so much uh, ma'am really nice lecture and a very very important topic uh, on uh, non verbal communication and uh, that line the patient may not care how much you know but he will know how much you cared Uh, very nice, nicely said, Doctor Parul. Do we have uh, uh, um, or any queries in the chat box that we might want to discuss? Um, Doctor Nishant, our speakers were simply magical, and uh, they have covered the topic so well that we do not have many questions. There's the chat box is just flooded with the compliments, and they say that uh, these topics should actually be the first classes of the postgraduate students. There's, however, there's a question by Doctor Amitabh Datta. He wants to know. that how the type of doctor patient relationship anesthesiologist choose to establish with his or her patients will influence or confound the establishment and sustenance of communication um any of the speakers would like to take this question that whatever relation he is established with the patient how will he uh, how will that influence his communication i think ma'am that is Yes. Pardon, ma'am. Can you repeat question once? Yeah, ma'am. Can ma you repeat? Then yes, ma'am. I can take this question. Yeah. Ah, uh, ma'am. The doctor Amita wants to know how the type of doctor-patient relationship you have chosen or an anesthetist has chosen to establish with his or her patient influence or confound the establishment of sustenance or communication. Yes, doctor Amita. No. Yes, ma'am. Doctor Amita. Yeah. Doctor Amita, uh, uh, for this question, and uh, I think uh, the patient and uh, the doctor relationship starts when you meet the patient first time. So if the patient is coming to you in the OPD and you meet the patient first time, you start conversing uh, with the patient and you start taking that relationship starts building up right from the first contact of the patient. and always see to it that if you know the first name of the patient and the patient is not very old you can refer with the first name and start and be congruent be honest and be clear and concise whatever the problems are you can discuss with the problem and the more you talk in the pre anesthesia checkup probably that relationship starts that therapeutic relationship starts from there so communicating with the patient with the relatives then uh, in the pre op period in the anesthesia uh, opd then in the pre op period and intraoperatively when you are beginning post operatively so all these uh, places if you have a constant communication with the patient probably that is a place where you can really build the bond and that will help you a lot because the patient will start confiding and start having faith in you which is so important and suppose 
for some reason there is mess up sometime at least they will believe that whatever you have done you have done the best for me thank you so much ma'am do we have any other questions or somebody would like to add something in this i'd like to add only one thing that as madam has rightly pointed out so we don't have to you know we know jazzy words regarding the relationships and how to build it my uh, experience is just keep it as simple crystal clear straight forward and that will go long way you know as we keep it simple and you don't have to be a sympathetic you be you have to be empathetic uh, towards your patient you don't have to bring extra um, or put something extra into that or you know you need not be a curt also just on a, any humanitarian principle which fits as simple as it is it will uh, help you to develop a good uh, communication and relation in the long term well said hitendra one more thing i would like to add is that you have to be you don't Use lot of euphemism or medical jargon. After intubate, kya? Uske baad aisa hua. The uh, uh, patient is not going to actually understand what you are talking. So medical jargon should be avoided and concentrate on the big picture. What is important should be told rather than looking for the small. One. And always remember, if you are communicating empathetically as dr hitendra is saying you have won the patient's heart in the beginning itself and you don't know where the mishap is going to occur it is not for sake of mishap but communication skill nowadays it has been added up in the curriculum also so ethical issues are getting importance and probably a day is not far when we are going to have a better tomorrow where we will be trained in all these ethical issues okay thank you so much ma'am we have some senior people with us uh, dr venkat gari we are blessed to have sir with us today so would you like to uh, parul uh, we will have to give uh, opportunity to all to unmute themselves and express themselves now everybody can unmute and interact with the speakers who have deliberated over last one and a half hour so on such an important and uh, difficult topic so sure, sir. Uh, yeah so everybody can unmute and uh, over to you dr giri um meanwhile while people are unmuting themselves ma'am there's another question can we talk to the relative if the patient doesn't understand any of the uh, speakers would like to take this question that can we talk to the relative if the patient doesn't understand the language see uh, if the, if the patient doesn't understand uh, I'm sorry, yes, Hitendra. Go ahead. I can I can join later. Yeah, uh, definitely yes. If patient there the, there is a communication, so you can either take an interpreter, and I think if one of the relative can understand what you are saying, they are the best interpreter. And at the same time, as I mentioned uh, in my talk also on paper, uh, mention that line in your consent form as patient is not able to understand what you are saying. You are communicating everything to the relatives. Let that line be come uh, in your uh, consent form, and if patient is able to sign himself, he can sign that over that line also. So these are the two things as far as this question is concerned. I'd like to add. Please. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, and it is very important as I said earlier that. the conversation has to preferably go in the vernacular language so try doing that and if the patient is not able to understand i think drawing diagrams and uh, making that is going to uh, help us and make the patient understand so various diagrams and all also can be taken help of or schematic presentation photographs or uh, pamphlets or the posters can also help Uh, even uh, i would like to add ma'am even um, the isa which has released the guidelines about the consent even in that there is one column interpreter or the attendant signature and the name of it so that clarifies the most of it that even isa has released the guidelines that it has given due importance and column for the attendant or the interpreter in that huge document which is well documented and well written so instead of the patient the attendant is definitely has the this thing to sign and uh, uh, take the onus of that yeah in one of the, the in the literature i read one of the incidents is that that is a study which quoted various interviews with the parents where the uh, children were involved in the palliative care so that that was very important 
that the uh, the diagnosis was told to the patient's uh, relative but then the parents did not know what to do so you have to be with the patient for uh, for the entire period like dr hitendra said rightly that i want to be with you at every stage say pre op i think there's some problem with ma'am's uh, network the ne network uh, bandwidth is slow so can we move on to the second question will be recognized if we are performing our role in all these phases of uh, the surgical procedures right ma'am uh, you can uh, switch off your video because we are traveling no? so audio will come let us switch off your video anjali madam okay okay so done, audio sir. will come good okay Okay. Uh, there's another so question. Sorry, sorry, sir. Uh, there's another question. Sometimes the patient's relatives they request us not to explain the complications to the patient. So if we, uh, what do we do at that, at that kind uh, of a position, Doctor? Uh, <clears throat> anybody wants to take up this question, ma'am? Who's better than you, ma'am? Please, ma'am. No, Hitendra and. Uh, uh, Anyway, uh, uh, can you repeat the question, Parul? Ma'am, the question is: Sometimes the patient's relatives they request us not to explain the complications to the patient. So, what yeah. do we do in such a scenario? So, yeah, that will depend upon the patient's condition, the level of emotions, and the coping strategies what the patient has. Right. So, right, uh, uh, and in that case, then the our role models, whatever we have learned, we have learned from our senior teachers and role models. so in that particular phase whatever fits in best should be done but uh, the way it is to be communicated that matters because many a times uh, uh, though the relatives are saying but then if the patient insists that he that should be known to the patient then unfortunately it becomes our responsibility to convey it in a better way that is empathetically Okay, I would so like to add, ma'am. In the similar way, it happens with the geriatric patients who are not able to understand what we are trying to say or what we are uh, about to tell them about the complications. If somebody takes the honors, then we have to get it signed that we have explained it to the attendant, and then only it will be justifiable. Because, like elderly geriatric patient, a couple is coming, eighty, eighty-five year old. They both are coming. They both are of the same. capability of understanding so they will not be understanding they will be saying humne aap pe chhod diya but if somebody accompaniment is there who is sensible enough who can take the honors then i think we if we can get the document signed by them as an attendant so i think that problem will be solved very so, apt very apt I, i i do agree madam because uh, if this question goes in a western countries it is absolutely no no one has to tell but in yeah. india we have a good strong familial system which is not comparable to the western part and so in india here as uh, diva madam has also rightly pointed out we can very well explain it to relative or any of the communicator or any of the guardian who can many of the elderly people or many of the kids they don't have a uh, you know they just have a guardian or they don't have a near and dear as well so we have we had faced this situation during the covid also so in that scenario just uh, mention it on the consent form and you can very well expl explain and then let them explain the way they their family system has brought up to the relative uh, to the patient but sir with this kind of a scenario when we have when the patient uh, the attendants room want to explain the scenario to the patient so we take a video consent and with the patient is not in the video so is it valid legally if the patient is not uh, there in the video legally, of consent taking legally even in india it is not valid let right, me be very blunt let me be very straight forward legally it is not valid because tomorrow same patient relative can say that i don't believe in my relative and the doctor has not explained so legally that's why i said that there are certain legal things certain legal things i think the way we are writing writing documentation will take over all these issues so that we are safe and uh, uh, i think little bit of idea can be given to the patient that will again depend upon what acceptance capacity the patient has right ma'am so ma'am the next question is by dr mohan patak who say, who wants to know whether audio visual explaining explaining and taking consent is safe ये है 96 ओ और वो कितना पंचर है बड़ा है 
May I repeat the question? The question is, if the audio-visual explaining and taking consent is safe. Dr. Mahajan, would you like to add something? Yeah. Uh, uh, see, nowadays it is a trend. Even in our hospital, we follow the same thing. We do take a written or a consent as per our guidelines. At the same time, every patient, we take an audio-visual consent. Right? Um, uh, right in the OD premises, we have an audiovisual room where every uh, communication gets recorded. But then again, this may not be the facility available at most of the hospital. But uh, my request will be uh, go for it. Establishing audiovisual room, room even in the smallest hospital is not that difficult. And with the uh, mobile and everything, uh, the gadgets becoming so cheap. So audiovisual consent definitely will help you along with the uh, written consent. So does the audiovisual consent has a stand in the portal floor? Yes, the same stand what written consent has got. So it, is, it adds to that. It becomes a documentary evidence where a patient cannot deny or that forcible sign has been taken or someone not told me properly or the I never read the form. That kind of questions automatically gets removed when it is audio written consent along with that written consent. That is how the video consent, that is how the concept of video consent is came so that it can be at least presented as a in a court of law that Otherwise, previously the surgeons and the patient used to say that we were not being told. But now we have that proof that yes, we have explained it to them properly and we are safe. So we have to play safe in that way. Thank you so much. I tell you one step ahead of that. Nowadays, uh, nowadays patients relative they themselves try to record it on their mobile. Sometimes knowingly, sometimes unknowingly. But what we do then, we tell them, look, we are also recording it. So you need not, if you want a copy of it, we can very well provide you copy. The moment we tell them their enthusiasm of recording vanishes when they, and then they, and another important thing, which we, which gets automatically communicated to them that we are crystal clear what we are going to tell you. And we expect the same clear communication from you. So automatically what my experience in last three, four years, audiovisual consent has really helped in making the communication clear about the expectations and everything. So it definitely helps. At least I can vouch for it. So we've got a lot of, we can discuss a lot about these topics, but we have to come to a conclusion. May I request Dr. Venkat Giri, sir, to please give his comments. Dr. Giri, a few comments from Dr. Giri, sir. Dr. Giri? As he's in that case, uh, so I, I, I congratulate uh, all the uh, speakers, uh, Dr. Anjali Bure, Madam, Dr. Jender Mahajan, and Dr. Divya Gupta for sparing their valuable time and sharing their thoughts, experience with us on this very important topic on communication skills pertaining to breaking the bad news non-verbal communication and OT etiquettes. I'm very sure and we will have them in with us in near future for another important and interesting topic. 100% So, uh, over to Nishant uh, for the announcement for the next class. Well, thank you, sir. And uh, next class, we have our own secretary, Naveen Malhotra, sir, who will be presenting a class on team science. So that will be something to look forward to. Our, our very own secretary, Naveen Malhotra, sir, will be there next time, uh, next Monday on the 10th, for a class on team science. Uh, sir, uh, thank you so much all for joining. And I'm sure uh, for the next uh, Thank class, you, Nishant, and thank you, Parul. Uh, for thank you so much, sir. Session. And thank you, thank Dr. You Dr. Dr. Chandra Mahajan, and Dr. Devya. Thank you very much. Long live IS. Thank you, sir. Jai Long live IS, sir. Thank you so thank much. You. Long live IS, sir. Thank you, sir. Long live IS, sir. A very happy Durga thank Puja. Nomi and Dashara greetings. Thank you very much. And best of the